Mike check one two Mike check one two welcome back to the Agostino Zinger show with me your host Agostino Zinger this is episode number one four five uno cuatro cinco I would assume in Espanoles welcome all wherever you are if you're Spanish you're Italian you're French you're Portuguese you're English no Maybe not English, you know, not not fan of those people. Stinky, stinky people. But regardless of who you are and where you are, hello and welcome back to my show. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're well fasted, well hydrated, well rested with that malarkey. I'm not sure why I'm getting all these notification signs going off in the background. We're going to have to mute that in a minute. But regardless, hope you guys are doing well and you guys are fine. So here I am back again in... um. It's a new time for me. It's later on in the evening. I had a half day today. I managed to squeeze that in, get some work done in the morning. Then I had to jet off for a little quick lunchtime interview. And now here I'm back again in the hot seat talking to you, lovely people. Talking about interviews, anyone else hate those interviews where you get, where you have to kind of do a fucking task, where they give you some sort of thing to complete, some sort of a, um, some sort of a pre-job uh, job job thing you have to do, right? It's super annoying, isn't it? Oh, can you do this thing? Do this thing for us, blah, blah, blah. But then some point is quite annoying, but in other points, you're like, you know what? I kind of get it, man. I kind of get it. I think if I was sitting on the other side of the table and then you were trying to hire somebody, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess for us, uh, people that are, you know, usually if you're not the person in charge and you're the one uh, signing up for the job, fortunately for us, um, you know, jobs are plenty. There's loads to go around. If you look around and you're looking in the right places and you have the adequate skills, you can kind of get most, you know, there's there's a plethora of jobs out there. I don't think you should believe any sort of a rhetoric you might hear with people outside of that kind of bubble. Obviously, it does require you to have the skills necessary to get the job in the first place. But if you have the requisite skills, you'll be fine. But I guess from an employer's point of view, there might be a lot of options. But once you make that option, it's very hard to change it. Because as most people know, when you start a new job, you get that probation period uh, where you and the employer can come to an agreement whether or not you think you're good enough for the job or mostly the employer can decide whether or not they want to keep you. And after that probation period's over, it's very difficult to let somebody go uh, for what you deem to be uh, an uh, adequate standard level of work, right? You have to kind of go through loads of, you have to jump through loads of hoops. You have to set up KPIs. You have to set up a, pro, a kind of program for them to improve give them room to improve and if they fail if they get and basically effectively give them enough rope to hang themselves then that can be turned over quite quickly but the process takes a long time so if you find somebody isn't a right fit after a three months probation period even if it you know the process is quite um straightforward and maybe the decision at the end once the person goes is quite quick the actual process is very long it might take maybe up to another three months to let somebody go completely you know because you have to give them time to actually try and improve so i get it so that's why usually some employers or most of the ones that I go and talk to sometimes, they do this thing where they uh, purposely ask you to, they maybe ask you before the interview starts to fill out um, a form or to do a particular assignment or to do something that can prove that you can do the thing that they want you to do. Obviously, for me, coming as a prospective employee is annoying because, number one, you know, you're do, having to do work that you're not getting paid for, number one, in a kind of, you know, basic sense. And number two, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, you know, it's annoying because even those times are not really good examples of your of your school level because you don't have the records of information you don't have the records of context you haven't spoken to colleagues you don't have any you don't have any reference to kind of lean back on right you kind of have to go into it blind and usually when you start a work a workplace regardless of how quickly they how quick they move or how mobile they might be it's very rare that you enact change or you come about and start a project on your first day right unless you're maybe working in production or something like that right where you're constantly having to move around and maybe you have to fill it for somebody and you do you, you know you just get you kind of get put in the environment where you have to sink or swim but in most cases office environments it's very rare that you're going to start and you're going to do a role right you kind of slowly grow into it you can understand what the role requires what you can do what they want from you the time the and, and maybe it t- totally depends on the time of year you start right if you start in a quiet period and maybe you're just you know there filing papers and shit right or moving papers around uh, quote unquote um um in a broader sense right but then if you maybe start in a more busier time, maybe before show season or whatever, or before uh, a particular item goes into production or something like that, maybe then that's when you might have to roll your sleeves up and get involved in other things. But regardless, um, it can be um, interesting and annoying in some regards. But one one cool thing today, I did, um, one, when I went to the email I went today, I, I did bump into uh, the guy from Vice, uh, Matty Matai, is it Matison? Matty Matison or Matty? The, 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 the fat guy with the tattoos. He's really cool. He's, he's, he's talking super loud. 
like shouting and shit. I can't really say it, you know. I'm, I'm probably the worst person to comment about um, volume. But yeah, that guy that's always talking super loud on Vice, I saw him in, in the lobby of the office I went to today, which was quite cool to see, actually, him just standing up. It's interesting how, um, maybe it's a celebrity thing, maybe it's an American thing. It's interesting how, how much um, people that you know stand out right i'm saying this out loud it probably sounds dumb maybe because i know who they are and i kind of recognize them but it's like it's like a beacon right you just see them like straight away huh? right maybe that's you know people come up to you and say well it's happened to me a few times maybe because i'm black on shit um but someone might come up to you especially if you're out and about and you know it, it might be my luck that i kind of bump into six people that i know and somebody might innocently ask me oh well are you famous or something right because obviously it's just weird isn't it? Like, all of a sudden i know all these people in this room right and they're not the same type of people it's like people from different sort of backgrounds so um but then that obviously is an action that's obviously people seeing me spudding six individuals so they might be like oh who the fuck is this guy i need to get next to him but in this case it's just like me it's like me coming down the stairs seeing this guy's back not even seeing his face and thinking oh who's that just automatically like i don't know why my, my head just went to who's that and as soon as you turned around, I saw his face and he was coughing and he was covered in tattoos. I knew exactly who it was. So, yeah, um, good to see him in around the area and stuff. So, Matty was around. Um, um, obviously, didn't say nothing because I'm not a loser. Um, I, I don't know. I just don't. When I see people that I know, I think the only person I've said hi to in real life who I've known, right, is being really cringe, actually. It might have been Dave, Statman Dave, you know, from Full Times Devils. That might be the only person that of any kind of notoriety that I've seen in real life that I've said hi to. Actually, no, I lie. Um, a long time ago, maybe a couple of years ago, I saw Graham Norton in Tesco Express and he was super cool. Um, why I say super cool? Because one, before I went to go speak to him, I was kind of stalking him um, behind the, the aisles as, one's, as one does, right? And as I saw, I don't know, probably 10 plus people come up to him um, and, and annoy him and bug him and, you know, ask to sign this and give him, you know, inane conversations. And I was like, you know what? Damn it. I'll be the 11th person. You know what I mean? So he could have easily like, um, got to a point where you know he had enough because again it was a Tesco Express near Bo I'm not sure if he still lives in that area he probably doesn't because I'm sure he, he's probably got more money to live in that area but I remember him being in that area and I remember someone saying he, oh, he actually does live around that area but um, he was just shopping in the Tesco Express next, next to Bo which is open quite late just having just doing his shopping um, quite late at night so it wasn't like a you know uh, it wasn't like a a press thing if I'm not sure you're going to do press and Tesco, but you never know, these people have weird sponsorships. So he was just out and about living his life. So he will, he's, he's well within his rights to say like, you know what, hey guys, I'm shopping, you know, I'm hungry, I just want to eat or whatever, do you know what I mean? Like, leave me alone. He could well have his rights to do that, but he went out of his way just to be cool. So that's the other person I think I said something to. And I just generally just said, hi, I love what you do. Keep doing what you're doing. Basically, that's it really. I don't really try and go any further than that for the most part. And usually it gets reciprocated anyway, because I think for the most part, you know, celebs or people of notoriety it's probably a flip of a coin the amount of people they bump, bump into who are just cool and can just you know exchange pleasantries and keep it moving so when you're somebody that does it on my end on your end if you're a listener if you do that same thing i think celebrities do really do appreciate it right that you just go out their way to say hi you know thank them for their work or something that might have really been um if uh, what you call it inspirational to you something that kind of gave you good direction something that was very meaningful to you and then set them to keep it keep it keep on going and keep it moving you know that's it no need to exchange jokes no need to show them your personality no need to tell them how critical you are about the other pieces of work like some people do these weird backhand compliments of like oh yeah i never used to like you before in the beginning but now i like you i've heard some people say that to celebrities in real life it's like what the fuck are you saying but i guess it's just, it's just a, you're just so nervous right when you see that person you don't know what to say so you just blurt out whatever but don't say that kind of thing. Like, don't don't try and give them the whole like you know you know that whole pickup community thing when people when they neg when they neg women. Don't uh, neg people that you like <laughs> in order to show them how much you like them. It won't go down well because they don't know you, right? Uh, just give them the compliment, tell them what you enjoy, and then keep it moving. As I did, huh? I kept it moving, and look at me, look at me now, right? Look at me now, look at me now, flossing, flossing, flossing. Anyway, we're back again, one forty five episode. Uh, episode of the excellent singer show thank you so much for joining me i said episode episode three times but you know what can you do let's get cracking with some topics of the day that i thought would be interesting to comment with you lovely people number one number one before we get started and before we go into any sort of influential or important topics i want to give a big shout out to mr benny gold mr benny 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 gold um news came through the wire is specifically from hype beast that benny gold has called it quits on his uh, streetwear label that he 
founded more than 15 years ago, um, back in the day when streetwear was resided uh, mostly on the East Coast of America with the whole like, retail mafia and um, on the West Coast uh, with the whole Fairfax crew. So uh, Benny Gold was an instrumental part of my kind of um, uh, journey through streetwear. Um, him and alongside people like Ben Hundreds and Bobby Hundreds and Nick Terche, Nick Diamonds, um, were all kind of really influential people that kind of really helped pave, pave my way through in terms of streetwear. And I'd say the one thing that I can give Benny Gold and all those guys a lot of credit for um, was that even though we had a scene in London, even though we had a little thing going on here with Good Hood and Gimme Five and um, Foot Patrol and all those kind of places, right? It was quite disjointed, um, I'd say for the most part. I would also say when I was in London and trying to come up in a streetwear fashion scene, um, it was very, they were very against letting in any new energy, which is ironic now because, you know, those give me five places are, are just full of young kids now, which is fucking cool to see that they give them kids opportunities. But in the beginning, when I started, it was full of everyone was super old. And that was when I was young. So I was 18, 19 then. And these guys were still around, right? Um, at the forefront with gray hairs and all that malarkey. And they weren't necessarily wanting to bring new people in, right? They didn't want anyone to step on their toes, which is completely understandable. They made niche for themselves. And it's not their responsibility to give anyone a chance, right? I completely get that. But one thing that I appreciate about the American scene was that those uh, guys that I mentioned, the Bobby Hundreds, the Benny Golds, the Nick Diamonds, they were very aware of who their customer was, right? Their customers were incredibly young, right? Incredibly young kids who kind of uh, live vicariously through these um, superhero designers and founders of these companies, right? And they were doing exactly the thing that they wanted to do. And instead of these guys adopting the uh, the personality or the stance of, oh, I'm the, oh, I'm the superior almighty lord, uh, bow before my feet. Um, if you want to get a job in this shop, you have to jump for a million hoops. And this weird little kind of like gatekeeper thing that was existing a lot in the UK where... Um, depending on who you are friends with, it depended who will say hi to you. I've, I've said, mentioned the story a few times when I went into Bond International um, RIP, one of the kind of main streetwear stores here in London. And even Nick, the guy that used to own Bond International, is it Nick? I think it's Nick, right? He's generally a cool dude, but even he got involved in that kind of, you know, a uh, dicky kind of vibe attitude that people had in the scene. And one time I was, I was going there quite a few times actually, and I was used to get complete air, right? Um, including the other Japanese guy that used to work there who, who, who generally is a little bit antisocial in his own sense, which is fine. But I remember going in there a few times, right? Because that was part of the schedule or part of the routine that you do on the weekend. You kind of go out, you put on your best outfit and you go and peruse around all the kind of shops in Soho and shit, right? And kind of, you know, check out some stuff and you might buy a fucking pouch or, you know, a pen or some stationery or a beanie hat from Double Tap something. You know, you, whatever you had money for, you might buy it later on, but it was just a chance to kind of go out and kind of meet some friends in the scene. So I remember going in there a few times and getting absolutely no love um, from the guys at Bond International. No one said anything to me. Everyone kind of like, you know... Um, completely vibe me out of the store as they do in most skate shops right which is understandable in the skate shop world because you know it's a little bit they, they have to be a little bit more protective of their of their scene because you know um there was a period where it was kind of about to get whitewashed so they had to kind of pull it back from the shopping malls per se and bring it back to the uh streets with a z at the end of it um so i do remember going in there and getting absolutely no love and then i remember bobby hundreds and a few other people coming over from the states to visit um nick from 12 bar who was a guy that was kind of influential in my kind of journey and then i remember the highs and the smiles and the handshakes were everywhere i, I think i remember one of them saying oh we remember you've come in a few times haven't you it's like what Imagine the 360 you're seeing in front of you. But the thing I liked about America was that, number one, like I said, um, with these people like Benny Gold, Bobby Hundreds, and Nick from uh, Diamond Co. Supply, they were very aware who their customer base were, mainly young kids. Instead of adopting this framework of being, or this position of being a gatekeeper and being a dick, they instead invited the kids to be a part of their journey right whether it was from blog posts whether it was from articles whether it was from meetups in the store i know benny um i've seen comments left by a numerous amount of people a amount of time he's given to people personally uh speaking to them and giving them advice when they want to get into design all these kind of thing really peeling back um the process and what he does and how he goes about things so you really got to, they really were conscious of how they were seen by the kids and they try their best to kind of live up to that standard or to be, you know, figures to point them in the right direction. But they never ever adopted this point of view of like, oh, it's my it's my arm in the door. Like if I don't let you in, no one's going to let you in sort of thing, which is a lot where the thing happened in London. 
So I want to give those guys eternal props. And Benny Goldberg being one of the main people to do that. Somebody who was very kind of like, you know, his story of like meeting Keith Huffenegel and taking part and, and being an instru instrumental part of the whole like Huff brand coming up is super inspiring. And yeah, and I'm just happy that he's kind of decided to kind of like stop the brand himself. I know sometimes in, in other places in the industry, it can be seen as like a fail or like a loss. But I think in streetwear, especially from the, you know, me following people like Hiroshi Fujiwara, even Nigo, um, back in the day, even and sometimes even Junta Kashi before he did the um, undercover there was a tradition in Japan especially in that kind of sense of streetwear even in the US some well, some kind of the retail mafia Lom de Girl could probably be um, put in the same category but there is a thing where in some with some streetwear brands where you're meant to it's not I wouldn't say cash grab but there is an element of it where you know you do some of your best work under a certain brand and then you might just stop it and just start something else just because you want to have a different creative vision right you want to go in a different direction or there is other times where as well where you just you know you see that a collection as a that marks a point in time in your life right and you kind of want to stop it and continue doing other things especially in Benny Gold's case him being uh quite um a well-respected designer in his own case, in his own regard, um, outside of his brand and the clients he probably has kind of coming out of his ass and the amount of work that requires, right? Client services isn't the fun. On top of doing your own brand and running your own store, I can't, I'm not surprised he decided to give it, um, to kind of call it quits, but I'm happy he did it on his own terms and now he's able to kind of ride, ride into the sunset, uh, still have his kind of legendary status uh, be solidified in the scene and kind of go on to do bigger and better things. But he he wrote uh, an entire statement that he kind of sent out to hype people which I thought was a really nice touch everyone will kind of know what's happening and he kind of you know talks about the decision and what went into it and stuff but um i did like this bit which is quite again transparent for kids coming up who actually want to get involved in this because you know i think in this day and age where we are kind of seeing i think i'm happy that the hustle thing has stopped a bit because i remember that was one thing that was kind of annoying me about virgil um he was continually in this he was just uh, pumping out this like hustle culture thing this hustle thing which i guess in his for his own story there is a lot of truth to it but I think by and large, we have to kind of see, because I think maybe because it's Photoshop and it's um, vector graphics and it's screen pinching on T-shirts. I think we kind of uh, we kind of dismiss the level of talent it takes to do that at a high level. So we don't necessarily um, as describe any sort of talent to or any sort of skill. But I'm going to say this at me personally, my own opinion. I think we have to treat people like Virgil and those kind of people as freaks. Like they're the Nilo Messi's, they're the Cristiano Ronaldo's of this whole scene, right? They can do it. They can hustle. They can fly 365 days in a year, right? They can do that. They can have multiple projects balancing at the same time and still deliver them at a high level. But most people can't do that, right? So to eschew that message as a way to kind of, to set, so for Virgil to sit there and say the hustle is why, is what got him there is a bit disingenuous because it's not. We all know it. Well, the reason why he's got where he's got to is because he's insanely talented. He works really hard and he's got great connections. But all those things together have made him what he is now. But you can't hustle without having the ability to just have your finger on a pulse, which kind of Virgil has the ability of doing. But also, I think if you do want to do that and you don't want to prescribe to the hustle culture of it, whatever the age Virgil's doing, I think the Benny Gold side of it is something, again, it's something to kind of like hone into and see how just how stressful it is maybe to run that kind of business. Like I said before, Benny Gold is a respected designer in his own rights with his own clients right um, outside of Benny Gold the brand he's got Benny Gold the brand that I'm assuming you know um, probably turns over a nice amount of profit every year he's probably got staff to pay he has maybe collaborations or sponsorships or licensing deals that he's doing on the side of that or under that, under that brand and then you're running a store itself a brick and mortar store especially nowadays with how hard retail is right so those are three really challenging businesses that he's doing on top of his kind of day-to-day -day job, right? So I'm not surprised someone in his position will be like, you know what, let me step away, maybe shut the brand, maybe do some special projects here and there, little collaborations here and there you might want to release, right? Um, and that'll be cool. Because I, I think he could do really well um, operating like someone like a Benny Gold, right? He does like and he does a really good sense, like even like MJC, right? All those dudes, right? They do a really good way where you kind of have a creative agency, and then underneath that umbrella, you do special projects with like key, you know, partners that you want to work with. And then you do client services in the background just to kind of keep the money rolling in. But you're not really beholden to anything. You don't have to pay a rent for a store. You don't have to pay staff continually year in, year out. You can, can hire people based on projects like someone like Hiroshi Fujiwara who only has, I think, two full-time people working for him and then everything else is project-based. That's probably a better way to work in general. 
But again, I, I just think it's a good kind of case study to see like Virgil doing it at the highest level, balancing his DJing, his Louis Vuitton, his Off White, um, his other capture collection, his collaboration with his brands, all this sort of stuff. And then you've got the Benny Gold who's doing that kind of on his level, but the stress and strains are kind of taking his toll on him and he kind of wants to step, take a step back. But he mentions it here in the, in the post. He says, uh, but with this success comes its own set of challenges. I now find myself growing less creative, um, growing less creatively as my days are spent managing people, budgets and production issues. See, I said like running an actual business, right? I'm feeling increasingly pressure to follow the trends and go more urban, which I, which again, I didn't really think about, but it made sense, especially if he's trying to, you know, if you're going to, if there's only so much you could do creatively with a brand, especially if you're trying to make more money, you have, there has to be that, there, there definitely reaches a point where you just have to decide whether or not you want to go all the way to like, you know, shopping level, um, shopping more level, or if you want to keep it on, on, big cartel but no you're only going to have a particular ceiling um i'm feeling a pressure to go more urban in the attempt to capture more of a market share a brand becomes a living uh breathing thing and every brand has a life cycle well it's because well it's become increasingly clear to me that benny gold brand is nearing its end i'd rather bring it to a close and celebrate its life with integrity rather than push it to become something i no longer believe in which i 100 percent agree with. that's always the saddest part right that's kind of my kind of beef with jeff staple and what he's doing with his dunks and shit um there comes a point where you kind of have to just like let people enjoy the good times that you've done or the the legendary status or the things that you've done that have been really important to the culture instead of keep rehashing it because unfortunately it's going to be tired people are going to get bored of it and whatever new thing it comes out of next is going to have this same stink the same fung attached to it so i'm glad benny gold took that decision again it's a brave decision because you know it's not as much stick as i might give jeff staple the money's probably really good man the money the exposure the the if he's especially if he's chasing relevancy and he wants to be the go-to person for culture and for like everything to do with streetwear then he probably needs to have his face there all the time i get it i understand but this is a really brave decision from benny gold because he could probably easily just continued uh plodding along you know uh, eventually the de de deciding to go quote unquote more urban maybe um, expand his collection maybe double the accessories all that sort of stuff he could have easily gone down that route and i guess people wouldn't be that, that against him because you know again he's got 15 years uh, worth of work under his belt if anyone has to sell out was Benny Gold but he still decided not to um, which is kind of really admirable to see and just again admirable that he decided to shut himself and kind of again let us enjoy his legacy like you mentioned before and go on to do other bigger and brighter projects so again um, big shout out to Benny Gold um, farewell from the scene and that I know you've gone for not but got and I'm sure he's going to have loads of kids in his DMs asking for help and he's going to be more than happy to help as well it's going to be cool to see um, his kind of offsprings right that have kind of you know used his business model or have kind of taken on his advice and that's it to his brand and see what happens there and the legacy to continue going forward so again a uh, big shout out to Benny Gold um, again one of my inspirations in street that kind of got me started so I'm happy to see that he's venturing off to other things um that was my soapy message out of the way next here we was we got here oh so um uh, talking about virgil off white full, full, full winter collection just um showed recently right before i got back in i think earlier in the day um everyone's in paris now because of Par uh, paris menswear fashion week it's probably the biggest event now isn't it outside of like the standard uh streetwear events i think no one really goes to agenda that much i don't really see that much coverage about it on social and on well i don't really um peruse social as much as everybody else but i don't really see much coverage of it on like hype piece and stuff i see a lot more coverage of people like um pro paris fashion week and stuff like that for the most part um that's when places like pages like celebrity vice kind of get most of their kind of content from um the in, in, in the ingoing and outgoing people that are in that scene um yeah and in general you know there's those those different heron Preston, the Virgils, these kind of people that are kind of, you know, they they sit on that line between, you know, fashion and streetwear. So they're kind of dragging people across to Paris and stuff. And the influx of new designers that are showing now in, in Paris, with especially when it comes to menswear. J.W. Anson debuted, uh, Celine, obviously, last season. There's a new energy coming involved um, with uh, Paris Fashion Week now, especially with Raph Simmons, who's now left Calvin Klein. He's going to be another onus for him to kind of really step up the level and crank it up like, so there's a really new strong energy that's happening in um in Paris at the moment, um which I think a lot of these designs are really you know vibing off of, and of course um Off White was showing Off White being Virgil's brand outside of uh, Louis Vuitton, and um it's been a bit of a rocky time I think personally from what I've seen of Virgil and stuff that he's done with Off White, it's kind of slowly but surely started to get a bit better season in season now in terms of just what it looks like. Um, it can sort of look a bit haphazard. Um, I think having had a quick glance at his collection, nothing's changed so much. And I think you'd have to kind of, I think I maybe got to a point with Virgil's collections where I kind of have to maybe think it might be on purpose the way it looks. 
You know, sometimes when people say it's not, it doesn't feel cohesive, it doesn't feel like there's a theme, it doesn't feel like um, it's a collection, it's more, it's more so like a, a, a collection of pieces of clothes, and that might, and that might be a good thing, right? Like uh, a collection, yeah, uh, yeah, it, might, it feels like a runway full of a collection of pieces of clothes that can be worn in different outfits, which might lend itself to the buying habits of um, consumers nowadays, right? They're not necessarily buying for looks, they might just be buying you know the trainers the socks the belt the jeans right and then cha- and then kind of flipping them in between other looks whether they be vintage or they be from other brands so that might tie into it but it just feels like he's never ever had a really cohesive collection regardless even when he's using the same materials right it always feels a bit haphazard all over the place and um again um maybe again that's the point maybe it's a, it's a canvas it's like an experimental canvas for him to kind of do his thing on um but we're going to kind of d- dive in a bit deeper into collection first of all i've got a video of some of the people that are in and around um the show to kind of quickly check that i hadn't seen actually which is quite interesting i think they might did this in collaboration with now fashion which is cool as well again showing you know outside of killing it on the kind of design front or in the kind of you know fashion output front maybe not design maybe people go oh he's a real designer whatever you want to say but in terms of killing in the output front right in terms of how quickly he's able to ship product or get work out there another thing that he's really you know a master of again some people in the same similar sense like samuel ross and those guys is they're the master of self-promotion right who they're attaching their brand towards brand partnership media partnership getting the word out there the king of distribution and no no more is a better example of this video which is i think i'm tying with now fashion on facebook it looks like um looks like the guest arriving at the off-white show there's a particular place where they want them to take pictures and stuff so again it's all very well in tune um, the people that are walking on the show are coming to the um to do see the runway show are wearing off white you know it's just a standard procedure that they do but again just the, the, the level of detail and tension and again it's not this is an extra on top of it because um again i'm sure the show was streamed i'm sure he's going to do the um, documentary series that he always does with the collection where he has a photo he has a videographer just follow him around um i think in the run-up towards the collection being um shown on the runway and they kind of chop it up into a really lengthy compilation with no with no narration or nothing you just kind of hear them running around it's, it's quite captivating it's a lot better it's weird to describe it because it sounds quite boring but when you watch it it's really really absorbing and you can't take your eyes off it it's something that you'd wish more brands would do i think they did something similar with the dior um, documentary that ref simmons did a few months a few seasons ago or a few years ago and um, that was kind of in the same sort of vein but it's quite telling and it's quite inspiring to see the kind of the, the inner workings of what goes into making the collection and choosing the looks and styling and all these sort of pieces so these are things that again that are on top of the design which again which is some of the more design-led designs that some of the more artistic um or based designers out there who are all about the craft kind of bemoan people like virgil and say oh he's only where he is because of promotion and that's largely correct but i think if you're that talented as a designer i think it's your responsibility to marry up with somebody or to partner up with somebody who can handle that media side because that's really important too you can't just be really talented at making clothes and have the ability coming out of your ass and no one know that, um, what you do, what goes into it, a bit of your personality. You have to be able to do it. Even if you can't do it yourself, I think you have to be able to do that a little bit. And Virgil obviously has done that. So we're going to quickly watch this video and see who was um, at the show. I haven't actually watched this, actually. So this would be a quite interesting first reactions. So let's see. It's presented by Now Fashion. Get some sound on here. Oh, Playboy Kite has gone blonde. Interesting. Not really liking it too much. Looks a bit burnt, doesn't it? It's a bit fucked up. You got Takeshi there, Murakami. He's obviously one of one of Virgil's um, good friends and collaborators there. Um, I think that's the guy from the the store, right? Great, right? in Tokyo, I'm assuming. That's always around um, those guys as well during that time and day. Um, you got a boogie there. No, not a boogie. You got Octavia, <laughs> Octavian. Sorry, a boogie. It kind of doesn't look like a bit like a boogie, no? A little bit, or is it me? No, I've been um, recently named the uh, sound of the UK 2019, which I'm not too sure about as well. I'm a big fan of Octavian, but um, I'm not sure if you'd call him the sound of the UK. Um, I don't know. I don't think I've heard one. I don't, I don't think outside of maybe call hips of parties. I'm sure I've heard his track played in the nightclub. Um, which again isn't really an inflection of who the sound of the 2019 is it's not you know sound 2019 in nightclubs but again I don't, I don't think i think the kids are listening to more drill than they're going to be listening to octagon for the most part. especially the the yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know but anyway let's continue perfect and one more yeah that's cool man oh the boots are dead though but I, I like his upper top nice octagon's out there doing his thing. i'm not sure who that guy is um not sure, not sure, not sure. He's opening his mouth, showing something. Nice, got grills. 
I'm not sure that guy is. Oh, we've got Don C there. Don C, no Kanye again, which is interesting, right? All, all of Kanye's friends, but no Kanye. Alili May. Um, rocking the rock, good, good. She looks good as well, as per usual. Always got nice outfits on. Always with the nice outfits, Alili, Alili, Alili. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that is. That's a model, I'm assuming, because she's smoking. That outfit's banging as well. I love that jacket. That was really cool in the collection. I think I might have saw that earlier. That was Heron Preston, isn't it? I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah, it's Heron Preston collection. That looks fucking banging. Uh, who else? Another model, right? No, that's Madison Bear, right? I think, right? It's a YouTuber. I'm sure somebody went off white. Um, not really a fan of the outfit personally, but you know, she's there looking pretty and stuff. So go, girl, go, go, go. She's even directing the photographers what to take pictures of. Fucking pro, innit? No, take the back. Good girl. She's telling them what to take pictures of. Smashing. They really like her, innit? She's still on the camera, Madison. <laughs> they really like this girl, but fair play, man. I like the off white and the Louis tie up as well. Well done. Looks good, Madison. Yeah. That is Madison Bear. I'm sure, sure it was. Let her go, man. Jesus, enough. She's still there. She's still here. Still here? Okay, and finally. They let her go. Let her sit down. So the guys are there, right? All, all Kanye's guys know Kanye. Shame, really, but hey. Um, Gunner, nice. Did great 2018, didn't he, eh? Mr. Gunner had a big, big 2018. Guna! <laughs> and who's... Oh, Skepton and Vern, right? Eh? All looking sad and shit. Nice. That looks good. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the guests were there and they had fun. Now to the collection, because that's the most important part of it, isn't it? Let's see what the collection's saying. Da, 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 wrong way collection. Let's get up here and go through it. So, again, I haven't seen it in detail, but let's see if, if anything has kind of swayed or changed my opinion on kind of the overall look and the aesthetic of the, of the show. Again, this is just my sweaty, Stratford, bubbly hat opinion, right? I'm no one to give any sort of insight on anyone's brand. Don't listen to me. Uh, listen to people that are actually doing shit on the outside. But um, if we were looking at it um, critically... I'd say just again, it's just I, I think it's just his aesthetic. We have to kind of get used to. It. We just have to just this just this is just what his clothes look like because it just always kind of looks a little bit misshapen. It, the proportions are a bit weird. Um, the shapes are not that interesting. Um, they're they're boxy, but without the kind of um, you know finesse or the allure that you might get with an old school Margiela piece or something nowadays that Valenciaga or Vetemar might make, or or you know an other myriad of brands. It's not that kind of sensuality towards it. It's all just a bit haphazard and just you know it just seems that like someone just cut. You know, imagine you just roll some cloth on the floor, you just cut out pieces and just like make. It just doesn't feel like there's any there's any sort of like you know I wouldn't say design but aesthetics associated with it it's all kind of you know it's not ergonomic there we go it's you know, like ergonomic chairs that have got that thing where it kind of you know um it's perfect for the crease in the bottom of your back right it's got a little divot at the end so you can put your little bubble button right there's nothing there's not none there's none of that it's all kind of just like i just see loads of clothes that's why i see i just see loads of fabric that can obviously be taken apart and worn different ways but i just see clothes i don't see anything else but that's just me again just talking from um the initial reactions of what i've seen here right so um that's that on the screen let's go to the next slide and continue on and see what i might like here um good decent messenger bag i think for the most part i think most people might like that i'm interested in these boots and shoes i think they're going to do very very well maybe kind of building on what we might have seen in previous collections again from what balenciaga and vetiman did with the kind of really high sock um shoe um heel that we saw a few seasons back then it goes to the saint laurent sparkly thing that um that we saw a few people wearing um and this might be in the same sort of vein right this sort of like statement boot that a lot of uh, brands are kind of doing so this might be very popular um and that's and this might go very well again i just think it could have been a bit more done with the shirt maybe you know the, as a look overall the kind of boots are just the only thing you kind of see there um Again, just my opinion. Again, just maybe too much clothes again for that for my liking. Um, styling choices on this look aren't that great either. You can hardly see anything for the most part. Um, quite utilitarian. Uh, but the trainers look quite nice. I say for the most part. Um, this look here with the orange, black and orange jacket is you know it's neither here or there. Might be some more detail up close. There's a denim jacket on the inside that's covered by a tie on the inside. There's a lot going. So it's really busy. 
which is what I say, right? And then you got something like this, which is kind of fairly interesting, right? You got this, you know, um, cowboy boots with this kind of uh, futuristic tracksuit, right? It looks like kind of like an off, so you, know, you know, like the Wi Fi symbol. Is it Wi Fi symbol? Is it Wi Fi? What's the symbol? Is it on? I forgot what the symbol is, but it kind of looks similar to that on the belt. So there is some interesting things in it, but again, it's just, it just looks like there's so much clothes there. Just a, just a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of fabric. Um, and then there is, and then there's some pieces here that really work well. Like this overcoat looks pretty interesting, right? Um, again, maybe the shape is not what you would probably want from that sort of piece. You might go to an acne and get something that looks a little bit better. And then you scroll down to the boots that look really interesting. And having have a perusal across Instagram, it looks like um, these are a collaboration with Phil Office London, who obviously is quite famous for wearing boots with a similar sort of look. Um, and they look really interesting. So a collaboration with Phil Office London that he's done and done with underneath Off-White, which again is uh, something that you can't really bemoan or begrudge um, uh, um, Virgil for, right? He's very keen to kind of bring in his kind of circle of friends into his projects and kind of allow them the opportunity to kind of do their work or get their thing underneath his umbrella, which is, you know, again, something that's super commendable. So for all the kind of disjointedness of the look, seeing something like this seeing some cool outwear pieces like this jacket looks quite interesting i think for the most part some of the bags look quite cool i'm sure the trainers will do very well for the people that like that kind of look there's some cool pieces involved but it's just a little bit too haphazard for me and it never seems to ever tie in i always thought in my opinion i always thought against my opinion i always thought maybe virgil wanted off-white to be like undercover Right, and the cover kind of doesn't really, you know, ascribe to any sort of like current trends. It kind of does his own little alien thing. What John Takashi does there is fucking incredible. He probably doesn't get the praise that he deserves, but it's very, con it's kind of conceptual, but in a really easily digestible way. Right, loads of their max, loads of their overcoats, loads of their jeans, loads of their boots could easily be uh, adopted into like, you know, the the wardrobe of most kids that buy the brands that they buy. Now, I'm not too sure whether Undercover is not stocked in most places or whatever, but I don't see enough kids who probably should be wearing it that should, especially when you look at some of the all-over print stuff they've done and some of the kind of photo print and faces stuff they've done. Other brands have kind of worked, and I think they just do it in a much better way. Um, so, um, especially that they're... Diff what's the diffusion line? Is it Johnny Undercover? I think it's Johnny Undercover or John Undercover, something like that, right? Like, they do really good one. I always thought Off-White would be the same sort of thing where it can just, it's just like a standalone thing, but... Even the looks themselves, they don't really seem to kind of flow anywhere, don't go anywhere. Um, I don't know. I don't know. There's some good pieces involved in it, like some good pieces like that I wouldn't mind wearing. The trainers look quite nice. Some of these fleece tops don't look too shabby, but I don't know. I'm just not too sure where the disconnect is sometimes with the clothing that he puts together. Like I, I quite like this look. This look is quite interesting for me. Um, you've got here a massive scarf of a, a, a plaid. It looks might, might be quilted. A plaid shirt. Um with some jeans and the boots, right? Which look fairly decent for the most part. I quite like that look. Um, I'm quite fond of the, the suits again. There's a lot of, again, loads of these suits are back in. <sighs> fond of it, but there's some details in it that I'm not really a fan of. The slits in the middle, the massive patch on the sleeve, not really liking the look of. And I think I might be put off on off-white suits that moment I saw Michael B. Jordan wearing one on the run on the catwalk. It kind of put me off forever. I don't think they kind of did him a good job um, um, styling that suit on his um, muscular body for the most part. It kind of did look a bit odd. Um, but yeah, there's some pieces in it that look okay. Um, I'm I, I'm kind of over the co-ed shows as well. If it's a menswear show, I just want to see men walking on the show, especially if there's no real interesting tie-in. I don't really get the point of it. Um Again, there's some interesting pieces involved, but for the most part, it's just not for me, I'd say, personally. Um, the, the suiting looks quite cool. I'd say the over the coats look quite nice. Good accessories, good bags, as per usual. Um, do you need to keep showing this sort of logo on the web belt again on the runway? I'm not sure if you do need to show that anymore. You could probably take that off the look and it'll work just as well, right? You probably don't need to see that anymore. Um, might want to see more, something more interesting. Um, I quite like this belt here with a kind of uh, block print all over it. That looks quite nice. Um, I'm not really mad at this look here um, with the kind of cat suit with the boots and the football helmet. This helmet on this girl sort of like bending the other way, so I'm not too sure what that looks about. I love off offsets. Looks probably look offsets look probably looks the best of all of them. If they, we if we saw more of this in the collection, I think it would look really well. Like this purple pu puffer jacket looks insane. So long, what's that? Floor length purple puffer jacket, massive with ni nice wide pants, some good deals in between. Yeah, this looks really nice. I think the offset outfit is probably my favorite of the lot, I think, of all of them. Again, um, fairly decent, I'd say. Um, like, probably not my favorite off-white collection. I'm not sure if I have a favorite 
all in all if i have a collection i, I like pieces from the the brand of rock quite like the the cowboy books look quite nice but i just want to see a little bit more from him you'd hope so and again maybe it's the um this jumper this his knits are quite underrated i think so but to say that i think there's a couple even in a louis vuitton show that didn't get the praise they deserve but maybe this is the consequence again of being spread too thin i don't think it is because i think again i think he's a freak i think uh virgil is a kind of you know the christian and other lalo messi of kind of the streetwear fashion game i think he if anyone can do it he can but it might be a consequence of being stretched a bit too thin right the collection doesn't really f feel cohesive but then that being said even before he was stretched this thin. He still didn't feel that cohesive. Regardless, there's some nice pieces involved in it, but I think overall as a collection, it doesn't really hit the mark for me personally. Um, but again, offsets look quite nice. Um, Carti here as well. Play with Carti. This look, I'm okay with. Uh, I'd probably pass on that one. But I think offsets was probably the most interesting of them all, I'd say. Maybe the last couple. And here he is, the main man here at the end. So yeah, um, another successful show, I guess, for him. Maybe it's again, it's another, it's just, it's probably more important again just to see him on a runway for the kids coming up. And the fact that he's up, he's doing it at such a high level to really high, I'm, I'm assuming the turnover for Off-White must be fucking insane, right? For the clothes that he, man, the clothes that he puts out. Um, I'm not sure if any, I'm, I'm sure everything that we've shown, we, that shows on the runway it makes it to the stores as well because, you know, the buyers probably lap it up because it's, you know, it's something that can sell quite easily. So he's operating on that high level with like two really important jobs on top of whatever he has to do, his own consultancy, um, DJing around the world. So I do commend him for that overall. So I think maybe there is a different way to kind of judge the work that he does. He's not just sitting in a studio designing collections like other designers are doing, which is, again, which is not saying that's easy, but I'd say there is probably a difference when you're like, you know, when you just, all you, can, all you have to focus on is the fashion, right? When you're JW Anderson, you have to maybe lend your hand to the business side. You don't have to launch stores. You're not having to curate um, playlists for Apple Music, right? You can just, maybe that's, maybe you can operate in that level when you're just doing that. Maybe when you're the Virgil, you have some things have to kind of go by and by and you have to maybe do things more as a collective. You know, you're seeing him always with his design team, bigging him up and stuff and whatever. So maybe that's the reason why, because there's so many people involved in designing his collections that it kind of looks the way it does um, as opposed to other people's collections, which kind of come from more of a singular voice. But there we go. There we are. So Off-White for, for win the collection again. And maybe some nice outerwear pieces overall. Off offsets, offsets look for me was probably my most favorite. But outside of that, nothing really to write home about, I'd say, overall. So I'm kind of eagerly anticipating the Louis Vuitton show that's coming up very soon. Um, what else is next here? Oh, Heron Preston debut at Paris Runway. Um, this is something that was quite cool to see, actually. Um, and I'll, I'm going to use this word, which I fucking hate when people use it. And only because I have, I've had a couple personal interactions with this person. And I kind of think he's a cool guy. But having seen this collection and seen it, just you know, in real life, whatever, or on the screen in real life. Imagine me calling the internet in real life. Um, but having seen this collection on the screen the other day... And, you know, seeing what the work that's gone into um, him getting to his position, I kind of have to say just, you know, out loud that I am super proud of Heron Preston, man. Um, I think regardless of what you may think of his clothes, regardless of what you may think of him as a person, regardless of you may think of whatever that whole crew and, and their self-promotion, whatever it may be, I think you always have to commend um, the fact that he's been able to come into the space, especially the fashion space, and be able to kind of carve his own lane. Um, it's something that's really commendable and something that doesn't go, should be said more, right? I think um, um, Matthew Williams, um, Virgil Abloh, Heron Preston, they're all kind of like showing like runway collections in, in fucking Paris, which is fucking insane if you think about it, right? These guys that started um from doing their bin trill stuff right who would imagine from the bin trill ages to now that we'd get these three different dudes with all their own singular vision doing things on their own right and again it's not they're not kind of doing it um just off the back of whatever friendship they may have because you know that time has long gone right you can't say now virgil's only where he is because of kanye because so much time has elapsed right you can't say heron's there because of virgil either because so much time has elapsed and you can't say the same thing about matthew henson matthew will sorry um matthew williams and um, Lady Gaga reference, right, right? You can't say that because so much time has gone past. He's now built his own body of work for him to reference from. So I think all that is um, amazing. And again, it's for to, for, to see Heron Preston go from bootlegging um, Givenchy Rottweiler tees to this is just insane. Insanely cool and insanely motivating and inspiring for anyone out there that's doing something in the creative space to see that you can do it as well um, in your own kind of unique and, and interesting way. And, and it's even more impressive because Heron Preston was never someone that struck me. He was never like a fashion guy. Um, 
he was a guy that did cool and interesting projects, right? He was someone that was very, um, he was more of a makery, like he kind of had that kind of sense about him. brand communications, uh, an expert in marketing. Like he's somebody that if he wasn't had, if he didn't have his own collection, he'd be an, uh, he'd be probably one of the best communication managers out there, right? Like in terms of activations, in terms of like getting a word out, like he's probably one of the best if someone wanted to hire him. But he's been able to kind of get with those skills and somehow translate into clothing and maybe the fact that he's not a fashion guy is what makes his clothes even better is what makes his clothes um more appealing i'd say um or i, I don't know like I, I like what he makes i like what he makes um i like what he does I, i'm not i'm not sitting here comparing him to like john paul gautier and stuff whatever but i think for that particular customer for that particular look i think he does it really really well like i think um he's um those kind of Instagram girl outfits, you know, the sort of like uh, crop tops with the il with the kind of uh, pajama, elastic legging pants things, whatever. I think he's one of the most underrated designers in that space. Like he, I think he does really. He, I think he does those um, foot outfits, the thought outfits, right? Those fitness Instagram foot outfits really well, better than probably a lot of designers out there. He really smashes it. That kind of orange tape on the front, the the style written in, in the Russian Cyrillic, like it works really well. That like kind of utilitarian look with it, with the kind of over or covert sexual hints, with the kind of pull tabs and the and the harness and the and sorry, and the harnesses and the waistbands and stuff. I think it works really really well. But anyway, let's get dive on deep to the collection. Uh, and I'll get his penis out of, my, out of my mouth. But um it looks yeah, it looks really good. I like this look. This is a look we saw early on with the model at the off-white show. Um the kind of um off the shoulder jacket that we saw a few seasons back in it when uh Demna debuted or it came back into vogue. People didn't people didn't really see it for a while. But I think Celine done it a few times too. Phoebe Philo at Celine. But we saw it kind of come back um into trend or into style when uh, Demna uh, debuted it. I think at the first Balenciaga show, when you had those kind of uh, mountain parkers that were hanging off the shoulder, and then a couple of seasons later, you had those denim jackets hanging off the shoulder too. So I kind of like that look. Um, I'm hoping that it's not just a styling thing, and it's actually like, you know, they've actually been cutting away, because I think the Balenciaga ones were actually had a strap that you could attach to your shoulder that can make it kind of hang off. And uh, I know the Balenciaga denim jacket was kind of cutting away that lend itself to be kind of hanging off of the shoulders a lot more easier, but it looks really cool. I, again, I like the little detail that he's kind of done for himself a little signature orange tab on the outside sleeve again something these are things again that you know just come from maybe the the you know the experience or talent he might have outside of fashion lends itself it's a nice little um design detail that can be spotted off from a mile away which i think is really cool and goes on goes unsaid um some cool little trainers here that we're seeing there might be the collaboration it might not be i think there might be the inline shoe that Karen debuted um he loves the flame tea with skull and i think this is one of the kind of like um signature pieces of um heron preston's kind of personal wardrobe for the most part just again just cool interesting clothes um i quite like him like i think i'd wear literally everything in this collection it's all incredible Incredibly wearable it's all incredibly easy on the eye um it fits in with most people's wardrobes i think for the most part i really like those pants as well they look here with a lady wearing i think i'm assuming a nike collaboration glass maybe collection number two some nice jackets and bags and boots and just really cool it really like resonates with me personally and looks especially like something like heron would wear himself anyway as well so again um great collection from heron debuted um the other day at paris fashion week which is again a cool thing to see someone coming from you know the forums all the way up to the lofty heights of the paris runway show again just really easy clothes to wear like loads of nice stuff again like the crop top things that he does are fucking cool i think it's really underrated stuff that he does for women um really smashes it this one as a co-ed show works really well because i think the heron preston aesthetic lends itself really well to this kind of you know co-ed vibe because you know it's less fashiony and more so just clothes nice clothes that can work really well in the purest sense of the word and here's a, a heron preston doing his best michael jackson at the end looks really cool man so yeah well done to the guy man congratulations on the show well done next on the horizon what do we have here uh, uh, uh. oh jw anderson show two um debut collection at um paris fashion week this is um this is the first time for JD. I went to the show in Paris, which is interesting because Luebe always shows in Paris. So I'm assuming this, he's probably main studio might be based in Paris too. So it might be a good opportunity for him to kind of, you know, just kill two birds, one stone, and just do the work there. And also I think in terms of competitive spirit, I know those guys won't say it. They probably never made it out loud, but there's probably a part of him that wants to kind of be in and amongst the conversation, right? He probably rates himself as highly or I mean, even more highly than the guys that kind of get all the love now. And I highly, and, I'm, and I think he's an incredibly talented designer already myself. So I'm not surprised that he kind of Wanting to kind of put himself out there and be in and amongst the fun. 
that's occurring there in Paris. Um, some interesting looks. I like this hood thing that looks kind of medievalish. Um, it kind of reminds me. Remember those kind of mesh, those sort of like metal mesh things that the soldiers back in the medieval days used to put underneath their helmets or sometimes wear or across their face with just a whole cutout so you can kind of like stop um, any sort of knife attacks on your head and shit or whatever. Um, that kind of reminds you of that kind of thing or maybe sort of like a monkey vibe. Um, but again, if you're talking about design, talking about just quote unquote fashion, this is where the levels are at, isn't it? Like, this just looks insane. Everything about this is just incredible. From the accessories to the massive sort of, like, bronze bracelets that look similar, kind of, in a way, to what Rick Owens did a few seasons ago. Those massive bracelets with the big discs in between that kind of look like you could slice somebody with it. <laughs> I'm not sure about these shorts with the elasticated hem bottom, though. They look a little bit nuts. Um, I love the odd shoes. I think he's done them a few times, right? Um, One shoe is one pattern. The other shoe is another pattern. They look incredible. Um, yeah, it's just, just really cool, man. Really fucking cool. Great bags as per usual from JW Anson. He kind of takes that kind of, um, uh, same sort of tech, same sort of, um, design aesthetic and ability towards Loewe. They always have great bags, even though they're a storied, um, bag, bag company for the most part. But again, I love the old shoes. I love the little accessories. The bracelets on the sleeve look really nice. And all in all, a fairly, fairly, fairly solid collection from JW Anson debuting at Paris Runway show the other day too um yeah all in all really nice collection i think so one of my one of my faves so far in paris we've got a few more big hits to come um that was that for now the like, next on the list oh um the last kind of one i think or last couple before i get into some other things um victoria beckham showed pre full collection as uh, so, again um maybe she doesn't get the hype she the praise that she deserves but i think since phoebe philo has stepped away from celine there is a void out there in the market for a designer that can appeal to that kind of customer, right? That kind of um, middle-aged professional woman who's kind of got her shit in order, um, who kind of wants to look, um, who wants to look, who wants to look in charge, but doesn't want to look tomboyish, right? Who kind of just wants to look, you know, like she runs a place, but with a little bit of femininity um, sprinkled in there, a little bit of sex appeal, right? Um, and just great looking clothes. That's one thing what Phoebe Philo does. She just makes amazing looking clothes for women. And um, the layering, the cuts, the color palettes, that's just brilliant. And there's not there's not really someone else to fill in that void. And it seems like uh, Victoria Beckham has taken that big, big, big decision and decided to kind of try and fill that void herself with some of her collections that she's done so far. Um, came back to London, I think, the last season, showing her collection there, which looked really good. Something I was really impressed by. I love the setting. I love the music. It looked really cool. And Pre Four's kind of built up to, upon that somewhat. Um, this fit model looks incredible, actually, in the outfits too. I'm not sure if it's kind of a purpose thing to kind of get someone to look similar to Victoria Beckham, but in a way, the kind of dark hair and stuff. But the fit model makes it look even better. But yeah, the looks here look insanely good, man. From the boots, I like, look at the look at the color palette here. That cream with that dash of hot pink at the bottom, that hill, it's just insane, insanely good. How good that is, right? This look here with the peep toe, um, fire high boots look insane too. Like, wow. The off shoulder green jumper with the leather skirt. Like, just insane. Like, everything. It's just so on point. There must be a job in fashion for that, right? The person just picks out the colors. Because the color palette on this is just really nice, man. I love the combination. Um, of these like muddy kind of browns and greens with the hot pink shoes. I'd never thought that would work, but that looks really fucking good on. Again, a nice little hit there. More grey with the... That on jumper there looks amazing with the sleeve sort of pulled up. A nice little de de detail. This would a look that you could easily replicate in your wardrobe. Looks fucking insane with a uh, with a camel overcoat, orange pants. Um, a nice sort of... Is that like a blocked... Color sweatshirt and roll neck, yep, and the signature pink shoes. Wow, 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 wow. And this is all pre four. Looks incredible. One of my favorite collections I've seen so far. Um, Victoria Beckham pre four, four winter collection. Looks amazing, amazing. Like even this look here looks incredible, right? With the snakeskin print and the hot pink shoes. So nice. This is easily like, you know, if you wanted something to wear during the day, um, working in an office and then you want to go out for drinks without going home and changing and stuff, like easily any of these outfits could easily kind of, you know, fit that bill. Like, whew, look at this outfit. It looks so good. <laughs> so amazing. This model looks banging.
banging, 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 banging. But yeah, I um, recommend you check that out. Um, Victoria Beckham Four Winter Pre Four Collection. Well, uh, uh, Gar- well, not recommend. If you don't care, then it's okay, no problem. But yeah, I, th- I thought this was really good. But anyway, that's it for me. Not too much fashion there. Let's move on up, move on in. Um, apologize for the extended fashion talk, but you know why not? You need to talk about these things sometimes. Uh, so, um, Futures album's coming out soon. Futures album's coming out on Friday, right? I'm look, really looking forward to it. I'm a big Future stan. I love everything that Future does. Future is my fucking guy. But it's been very interesting to see um, Future do a press run, right? It's something that he's never kind of done. He kind of promised he wouldn't do any interviews after that famous uh, Tim Westwood interview where he kind of... Uh, um, where Tim Westwood asked him one question and he decided to go on a 30 minute or so rant or kind of, you know, um, maybe um, sharing his consciousness out there with us or whatever it may be called, which is one of the most legendary interviews you'd ever see. So I recommend you check that out. Tim Westwood with Westwood. Tim Westwood with Westwood. Tim Westwood with Future, sorry. Um, and since then, he kind of said he wouldn't do any more interviews, but now it seems like he is, right? He kind of is coming back in for his new album. He's kind of done the entire press run. He's gone to all the major players and kind of gave him a bit of his mind about what he's kind of thinking about this album, which is interesting. Um, I'm not sure whether that says something about his position in music at the moment, whether or not the emergence of the Gunners, the Little Babies, and all these other kids coming up has been, has kind of shown that maybe his star is dimming somewhat and whatever cl- cl- and whatever listener he had in the past, they've kind of gone in and found new people to listen to. So he's trying to maybe recapture the market and re-engage those customers. Or maybe it's a shift in the music industry where we're going to see maybe the death of surprise albums unless you're like the top tier people, like your Ed Sheeran, um, Adele, all these kind of big ticket people, or Taylor Swift. I think outside of those people, I think, um, artists have now seen maybe surprise albums don't work in your favor especially when you don't give the customers enough time to get to know when your album's coming especially with the amount of stuff out there it's interesting because it's kind of um, a bit of a contradiction right there's a lot of music out there people don't have time to listen to it, anything but then it also feels like if you keep releasing stuff without letting people know that you're releasing it or having a kind of rollout schedule or a plan in place then it just gets lost right in the in the absolute mist of everything that's around there so you kind of have to do both. You kind of have to consistently drop music, consistently put stuff out there um, in order to kind of make sure people are always talking about it to, or to make sure that you're always kind of on, you know, on the pulse of things that's going on and re- you're reacting to what's hap- happening around you and also showing you off a bit of creative flair, right? If you're an artist and you can uh, just definitely make 30 songs, right? A day, um, a, a, a song a day for a month, right? Then you should probably try and put that shit out there just so you can quickly get that quick feedback right and you can just show people just you know you can just kind of flex your artistic muscles um but there's also a part of it if you want to craft and you want to sit down in the studio and really kind of hone your craft and get it right that's also fine but you have to make people sure people are aware that you're doing that so they've got something to look forward to so i think it's a kind of a bit of a it's a balance in that so you have to do Future's kind of maybe dabbling in that a little bit. We're seeing a big rollout, but I think what we're seeing now is a repositioning of Future, sort of similar to when uh, The Weeknd released Starboy. We heard a completely different aesthetic from what we heard in mixtapes, and we heard The Weeknd kind of trying to go for the charts, right? He mentioned it in a few interviews. I think um, most notably a really good interview that he did before, The Weeknd did before he released Starboy with Billboard magazine, where he kind of spoke about how, how difficult it is actually to write a pop um, a number one pop single right because effectively you're having to bring all these different audiences together to kind of like your music which is not something that everyone can do so what we're seeing i think with future especially after i saw him um live at the o2 was that i saw somebody who had kind of elevated themselves and kind of tried to push themselves a bit further than the you know conventional rap pack that kind of exists or the trap sort of artist. Um, he wasn't just rapping over. A, he wasn't just rapping over an instrumental. Um, he wasn't just standing there on the stage by himself. He had massive screens at the back that kind of um, changed the graphics depending on the songs that were playing. He had lighting people. He had this, he had dancers on there. He had fireworks, pyrotechnics. Like what you could see there when I watched him at O two was that this guy is trying to be a pop star. He wants to be the biggest star that he can be. Right. He's not content with just being like the biggest star at Club Live. He wants to be like well known, an industry name. A kind of household name in that regard and, and anyway to do that is to create music that kind of you know covers a broad span spectrum of musical taste it can't just be one certain that um thing it has to be more than that and he probably has done it right he probably can sit there and say to you look i can do mask off 10 times right that's boring to him maybe to us as a listener it wouldn't be but to him as an artist it might be boring what's more in- interesting is maybe to get a bit more introspective in a record maybe to kind of a bit more conceptual maybe to do a collaboration that no one really saw coming maybe to change melodies song structures challenging things 
There's things that are challenging in order to kind of get him up to those kind of levels where he can be headlining festivals and all that sort of malarkey. Right? I think that's where you probably would want to go to um, the, um, the longer his career goes. Or maybe he might c- completely... Um, what you call it, switch, because he mentioned before he's he's got a new deal, he's getting football numbers. Maybe that might mean he's kind of taking more of a of a writing, producing sort of slant on it, because we've known, you know, he's has he's written, he's written loads of hits that we probably are aware of and not aware of, so I'm sure that's something he wants to do. But it's interesting to see where how he's doing it and where he's going about. One interesting insight to glean from the whole round of in- interviews was um, the explanation that he gave... Uh, Regarding is it la di da I think with genius, right? With um, Rob Marksman, he probably might be the worst dressed um person in hip hop outside of um, Joe Budden. But he mentions quite quickly here how he got to the la di da di da on the King is Dead. Um the sound is this soundtrack for that's the soundtrack is the soundtrack for Black Panther? That is, right? Um so he mentions how he kind of got on that track and how he kind of that kind of verse came about in this little clip that I'm going to play for you now. From Genius. Da, da, da. It goes here, then play it. J Rock, King's Dead, with J Rock, you know, featuring you and featuring Kendrick Lamar. Man, you had a verse there that drove everybody crazy. People ain't know whether to love it or hate it, and they ended up loving it. I seen the whole Madison Square Garden when J Rock performed. They dropped the mic, and everybody said, and it became this thing, like this cultural kind of phenomenon when you go in the club, it's the part that everybody sings in the song. <laughs> Did you know that was going to happen? Like, when you're in the studio and you're like, this is it, you know, you kind of change the voice different. It was like, yo, what? Is that people? You know what's funny too about that? He's right, what Rob is saying there. Here's a part, whenever you're in a club and you hear that song come on, that's a part that everyone can't wait to sing and say. Uh, but when it first dropped and you heard it on the... Uh, when you heard it through MP3, wherever it may be, or you streamed it. Whenever, when I when I was on... um hit, When I logged on to Reddit, I was a hip-hop heads subreddit or in other forums everyone was complaining about that bit and was saying that how he ruined the song right so the people on the forums the people chatting online who everyone's kind of trying to cater to hated it but when you actually play that thing out loud to people in real life they love that bit so it's like i'm not sure if it's like the people on the internet were um you know purposely kind of like poo-pooing it because they didn't want to act they didn't want anyone to know they liked something so base and something so stupid and nonsensical or it's the fact that there is a real disconnect between what people like on the internet and what people actually like in real life i don't know Future and it's it just crazy. blew up. It's crazy you said it because when I did it, I did another verse, and then at the end I did the lotty dotty part, but that was my favorite part. But I was like, man, I'm just bullshit. I'm just playing around. So I did the verse first. I did a verse for the song, and then I just did that at the end, just in case they want to keep it like an outro or something. And then he kept it, like Kendrick kept it. <coughs> I was just like, man, I ain't working on the verse. He was like. <coughs> Man, that's dope. But then when it came out, everybody was like, it was like that. They like gravitated to that part like that. I'm like, Damn, that's the part I didn't even want. I didn't even do it in the verse. I just actually left it at the end of the, the end of the song, and he put it in the verse. So shout out to Kendrick for doing that. That's, that's cool, and that's awesome, isn't it? Right? Oh, so I'm dying here. <coughs> oh God, I'm dying. <coughs> oh shit. But anyway, good to know. Story wise, that he that's what happened. Before I die and my eyes pop out of my head, before I was Bob Marley, but obviously not. I'm just an hour into the show now. <laughs> oh, God. Um, okay, composure done. Jesus Christ. That cough is always the worst, isn't it? <laughs> cough is always the worst. But anyway, it's now into the show now. I think it might be a good time to stop and to end. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been the Excellent Zinger Show, episode number 145. As always, for information regarding moi, Please check me out on my site, axnozinga.com, um, for info regarding my DJ gigs. Um, all that sort of malarkey stuff can be on there. Um, I'm DJing this Friday, this Saturday, and I got quite busy a couple of next week coming up with a few other dates in Dawson I've got announced, but I haven't done that yet. So keep your ear close to the ground or just re listen to the podcast. You might hear it again or just follow me on social. You'll see the flies go up again very soon. And yeah, apart from that, I hope you guys have a good rest of the week. I might be back again for another podcast on Friday. But I've got quite a busy day tomorrow, so um, also I've got quite a busy couple of days, so maybe not. And if not, I'll see you guys again next week. Enjoy your weekend, end of the week. Uh, keep your head on if you are doing your re- resolutions. Don't give up just yet. It's only a short period of time to go now before the end of the month. Hang on in there, and I'll see you guys again very, very soon for another episode of the X News Eagle Show. Peace.